welcome everybody. Um, background in law enforcement. So I started my career in 88. Uh, that's, that's a long time ago. Started my law enforcement career in 88, became a hostage negotiator in 97, team leader 2001, team commander in 2004. And that's the position that I held up until the time that I actually left law enforcement for good in 2017. And, and in, that, um, in that time frame, I was fortunate enough to cross paths with Chris Voss, the CEO and founder of the Black Swan Group. Uh, we met probably in 2000, 2001, somewhere there about, um, I was at the time pretty, how should I say, pretty prolific in the Washington DC area when it come, when it came to matters surrounding hostage barricade management. And he was introduced to me by a mutual friend of ours and, um, the rest, as they say, is history. He punched out of the FBI in 2007 and then um, brought me on board as a contract employee. I think it was 2010 that I did my first hit with the Black Swan Group overseas. We were um, we were all we were training at the time members of the China Development Bank at a business school in Germany. And, um, that was my first hit with them. And, and as I said earlier, we haven't looked back. Um, it's been a wild, crazy ride over the past, uh, 20 some odd years that I've known Chris. Um, and, um, the things that we have put together here at the black Swan group, we think are techniques that are different than anybody else is teaching anywhere else on the planet. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to share with as many people as possible what it means to be the Black Swan family, what it means to be a part of a unique community that are using specific skills in, in a specific manner to uh, facilitate specific results. So that's, that's how I became involved with uh, Chris Voss and the Black Swan group. Absolutely. And I know just from my personal experience, Derek, you are a very cherished member of the family. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and going into today's topic, um, could you tell us a little bit about what hostage negotiator leadership and that that abbreviated is HNL, hostage negotiator leadership. What does that mean and why is it a great framework to build in a leadership position? Um, all right. So uh, that's a good question. So the, the framework, h &L framework is based on a simple premise that was taken from the world of hostage negotiation. And that is ask yourself what your work environment would be like if You treated your direct reports with the same level of deference and subordination that hostage negotiators do hostage takers. What if you treated every difficult conversation that you engage in in the workplace like a hostage negotiation where you are the negotiator? That's in a nutshell, the framework of hostage negotiator leadership. You have a responsibility to the organization. And sometimes that responsibility to the organization trumps your responsibility to your direct reports. And in hostage negotiator leadership, we're always focused on what the impact is going to be when I make my ask, what is the impact going to be when I have the conversation prior to making my ask? How is that going to impact the other person? What negative emotions and dynamics are going to be produced as a result of the difficult conversation? That is the way that we managed all of our hostage negotiations. Our ultimate goal as hostage negotiators is to get the people out. 
get the bad guy to release the hostages and then ultimately surrender himself or herself. Now, we know that's our goal going in, but we never lead with that goal on the initial conversation with the hostage taker. That goal, that objective is subordinate to what is going on with them. In other words, what's their frame of reference? What is their view of the world? What negative opinions, assumptions, or impressions are they going to have about the message that I'm going to relay to them? And how can I best mitigate those negatives? Because the mitigation of those negatives is your first step at employing tactical empathy. And that's what's missing in a lot of our um, professional or, or corporate workspaces is a healthy dose of tactical empathy, understanding that it's not about you. Understanding it's not about your goal. It's not about your objective, your case in chief, your ask, at least for the first 75, 80% of the conversation. It's about the other side. And so hostage negotiator leadership relies heavily on tactical empathy, primarily because of the power that it has when it comes to reciprocity. As a manager, as a boss, if you display that level of tactical empathy first, you will generate more collaborative responses from your team. And that's what we're ultimately trying to do. Create an environment where the team members are doing something that you're asking them to do, not because you ask them to do it, but because they, because they want to. Because at the end of the day, anybody anywhere on the planet would do anything for you if they trust you. If they trust you have their best interests at heart. And so that's the, that's, that's the environment that we're trying to create in the workspace. And that goes back to my earlier question, how much better would your workspace be if you were to conduct yourself just like that as a hostage negotiator dealing with a hostage taker? Absolutely. That was a great explanation. Um, and regarding the hostage negotiator leadership framework, uh, Henrik, we have... You can unmute your mic and ask your question to Derek. Henrik, can you hear us? Um, looks I think like we you might have some technical issues. Could you unmute your mic, Henrik? Let's try it again. Doesn't look like it. Okay. That's a shame, too, because I knew he had something. He Henrik yeah, always comes in hot with the questions. He always yeah. comes in hot with the questions. Well, let me see if I can read it. Give me one second. Henrik says, hi, Derek, great to be here listening to you. I have a question regarding how to integrate H&L in a specific case. Let's try it again, Henrik. Can you unmute your mic? Let's see. Okay. We have another question, but I will say, Henrik, if you can exit out of the app and come back in, will allow you to ask the question again. Um, our next question is from Amber. Amber, I'll bring you up on stage. Perfect. Amber, could you unmute your mic and you can ask Derek a question? Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Is my we internet can. connection. 
Okay, my internet connection is a bit slow. I have a question from a friend who's asking, um, <laughs> who is asking how to deal with assertives who are giving out orders, immediately taking charge when they first meet. Um, practically, they immediately start order ordering them around. And it's one of those classical situations where you think of all of the great things you should you could have said only long afterwards. Uh, how to deal with people who assume control, take charge of the encounter. Um, practically, it's kind of like a pretty overt bullying situation, let's say. Uh, avoiding meetings with people is not always possible. With these kind of people is not always possible, especially in a work environment. So how do you, like even referring to ego authority failure, how do you handle a situation like that? All right. So let me ask you a question before I answer, Amber. And that is, when you are subjected to that kind of behavior, what does that do for you emotionally, internally, um, cognitively? What does that do for you? Okay, um, knowing this person, it probably causes her to freeze. My, me personally, when people do that to me, it depends on the situation. It can either trigger a angry response or else I personally go into deferential mode. I switch on my customer service hat. Uh, it's not always the case, of course. Mm -hmm. However, this person in particular is often um, bullied at, uh, at work like this and has been trying to deal with the situation best they can. They just don't have many techniques down. Yeah, understood. Understood. So um, the first thing that I would recommend that you share with them is we're always – with the black swan method, we're always on the hunt for the motivating factors. What's driving the behavior? We get so wrapped around the axle that this person comes in and throws their weight around and gets bullied and, and takes over the show on every project that they get involved in and how that makes us feel that we don't look what, at what the driving motivation is behind the behavior. For every behavior, for every statement, for every question, there is a reason behind it. And your challenge, your friend's challenge is going to be, how do I uncover what that real reason is? Part of that is going to be intuitive. Part of that you're going to pick up simply because your gut is telling you. If you're willing to listen, that's where most people fail, is that they're unwilling to listen to their subconscious. Your brain um, is, a, is a powerful supercomputer. They've been trying to duplicate the computing process of the brain in desktop and laptop computers for decades, and they cannot do it. Your brain, your conscious brain processes probably 40 bits of information per second. Your subconscious brain, i.e. your intuition, your gut processes 20 million bits of information per second. There's a lot of data coming at you from the other side that's going to scream at you what's going on with them. That's where your frame of mind needs to be, is determining what is motivating the behavior. The bullying is incidental. The taking over of the conversations and being very aggressive is incidental. There's something that's driving that. And so... I know you're a third party in this conversation, but I want you to use your supercomputer, Amber, and, and tell me when you're subjected to the person that's coming at you with both barrels and they're being aggressive, they're being bullying, they're, they're, they're bullying you, they're trying to push you around a room, assert their authority, impose their will, what do you think is going on with them internally? They probably feel threatened. They trouble probably trying to take over uh, control because they see uh, like they're they're afraid that you will maybe outshine them or something of the sort. Like especially if it's a situation where it's a boss dealing with a, a millennial, like an an older boss dealing with millennials, for example. That's that's one thing I've noticed. 
um, very often these people, they have a very, very little self-esteem and they see some the other person as like the other day with Sandy, uh, we're talking about the body posture. Probably in my talking right now because I'm crouched over again, I'm coming across as much weaker than what I actually am if I would assume the proper body posture. So there's a lot of that in the mix. All right. All of that. I never said that I was worried about being outshined. I never said that I was worried about having something taken from me. But those are all signals that you picked up based on this scenario as presented. That is your subconscious brain telling you this is the data that I'm picking up from the other side. What is the best way to manage that person in that situation is to identify and verbalize what you just told me. They're being threatened. Fear of loss is the single biggest driver of human decision making and behavior. What you just described for me was a fear of loss on the part of the person who is acting out in the fashion that you described. They're afraid of being outshined. They're afraid that the boss is going to take favor over someone else's idea as opposed to theirs. And that is a loss of face, mm. self-esteem, respect. Mm. And that is what's generating that. So the sooner that you, for example, use a label to identify that for the other person, the further along the path of mitigating that counterproductive behavior you go. Because even the aggressive bully who just can't seem to keep their mouth shut and seems to take over every team meeting that you have, they're telling you by the behavior that you don't get it. And the sooner that you demonstrate for them that you indeed do get it, the better off both of you are going to be. And the chances of you correcting, air quotes, that behavior becomes possible. Because it doesn't matter where they fall on the spectrum. Assertive, analyst, or accommodator, everybody wants someone else to understand what they're going through. And this is good for all of you when you're talking about counterproductive behavior, persistent counterproductive behavior, because that's what was just described to me, because you said this happens often to this particular person. Mm. This, that is the, the counterpart jumping up and down screaming that you're not getting something. So when you're faced with any type of counterproductive behavior that's persistent, whether it's taking over meetings, being a bully, uh, speaking with you aggressively. Your challenge is to find out where it's coming from. And counterproductive behavior, the likes of which I just described, is done primarily for three reasons. You don't, you're, you're missing something. That's reason number one. You're failing to be sensitive to something that's important to them. Reason number two, they're under tremendous pressure from somewhere on their side of the table and you've failed to acknowledge it or they're doing it because they're trying to manipulate you or get over on you. You have to stay in the moment to figure out which one of those three it is. Because if it's the first two, nothing is going to get better until you address those negatives as they see it. If it's the third, if they're trying to manipulate, there's nothing in our playbook that says that you need to be victimized by manipulation. And so with, with persistent counterproductive behavior, you need to address it because the longer that you let it go, the less influence you're going to have with the other person. In other words, if, if, if I repeatedly smack you in the face with a brick every time that we talk, I'm going to think to myself, Amber's just going to sit there and take it, so I'm going to continue to do it. And every time that I'm able to do it, your ability to influence me becomes less 
and less and less until the the relationship just spirals out of control. Hmm. Is that helpful, Amber? Extremely helpful. Thank you very, very much. Right. Great question, Amber. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Jigar. Jigar, could you unmute your microphone? Hi there. Hey. Uh, Derek, so great to speak to you. I got a, had a chance to ask uh, Chris a question yesterday, and so I'm really excited to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you today. <clears throat> One, uh, the question I had for you is: is it's something that I've noticed um, when I, when I've heard you speak and Chris speak is your vocal cadence, and I wonder if it's something that you guys. <clears throat> Well, I mean, I guess for you guys, it may be second ha second nature now, but is it something that you've actively practiced? And is it something that you turn on? Uh, is it something that just is part of the way you speak now? And, and sort of tips and suggestions on how to get really good at that. I've always noticed when you guys speak, you're slowing things down. It's, it's incredible. Like once you've pick it up. I, I can hear it and I can see what you're doing. Uh, and I feel like it's something that I need to get better at. And any tips you can uh, provide on vocal cadence and using that, using your voice to execute on some of these tactics. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, at this point in my life, it is, it, it is second nature. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't always like that. By default, I'm an analyst, so by default, I am in that late night FM DJ voice. The mo more, the more often than not, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so, because of my negotiator personality type, I automatically default to the late night um, FM DJ voice. Um, it provides less of a threat to the other side. It conveys seriousness to the other side. Um, and uh, it, it provides an opportunity for less confusion when you slow your cadence down. Now, to, to your point, tone, delivery, cadence, projected sincerity are probably, not probably, they are more important than the actual content of your message right now i can i can go into s several different voices and reach into your brain and i can dial you up and dial you down just based on my cadence my tone my delivery my projected sincerity if there is any i can amp you up and i can calm you down just based on my tone of voice so all of you need to be cognizant of not only the content of your message, but how it's being conveyed. Because in every difficult conversation, and that's what a negotiation is, whether you're negotiating with a subordinate, a superior, a peer, or outward facing, where you're negotiating with current or prospective clients, you're in a difficult conversation because on some level I want and I need is in your head. I want and I need is in the head of your counterpart. By default, you are on opposite ends of the spectrum. By default, there's going to be negative emotions and dynamics tied into that conversation. And we're trying to mitigate those negatives as quickly as possible starts with your tone of voice. You need to remove yourself as a threat during the conversation because if you are viewed as a threat, no meaningful dialogue is going to take place. Now, to your question as to tips, you're going to have to practice in the mirror slowing your cadence down and deliberately enunciating every single syllable of every word 
as you're pushing through the conversation, especially when you get to that point in the conversation where you're going to make your ask, you're going to draw your line in the sand, you're going to tell them this is the state of the world going forward. And it's just, if you're not an analyst, it's going to come harder for you because if you're an assertive, part of your delivery is aggressive. You don't think it's aggressive, but that's how you come across. So you are going to have to work on in the mirror. How do I slow myself down to remove myself as a threat? As an accommodator, accommodators tend to be upbeat, friendly, and their cadence, that staccato is rapid fire because they're, they're, they're running on, um, they're running on high positive energy. And that cannot, that may not sit well with an assertive or an analyst. So you're going to have to practice on slowing your cadence down. Fastest, easiest way for you to do that is to practice in the mirror. Watch yourself saying the words, watch yourself speaking slowly, and you will start to groove that neural pathway that will ultimately make that a second nature habit, so that muscle memory, so that you're not even thinking about it. Make sense? Fantastic. That was brilliant. And uh, I, I really think that what you've just talked about is one of the hardest things to learn and and do. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, you've given a great explanation here to, and, and that really helped me, um, you know, put the work in and get those neural pathways uh, set uh, in the right direction. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, love everything you guys are doing at the Black Swan Group. Uh, again, much uh, respect and gratitude to all of you for all the free content you give. Uh, you're extremely generous. And, and thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you very much. Shay, what else we got? Yes, we have Christian. Christian, could you unmute your mic? Yeah, happy to. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Relatively straightforward on this one. It's how do you basically convince somebody that you're not a threat and that you're supportive to their cause? One thing that's happened to me personally a handful of times have a lot of graduate degrees, know a thing or two about a couple of things, and customers will come to me for information because they know this about me. Somebody else is leading a project that really rubs them the wrong way. And sometimes no matter what I do to try to say, hey, I'm on your team, I'm supportive, it's just they'll come back and take any opportunity they can to counteract or undercut me or undermine me or point out when I may have said something incorrect. So how do you support somebody that doesn't necessarily seem to want to be supportive. They just want to show that they're number one. All right. So this is somebody internally that works with you. That's undercutting. you. That's correct. It's um, I, I think they technically may even report to me, but they're a leader of a project. I'm just a subject matter expert. Right. Um, and why do they view you as a threat? Is it because of your degree? You know, to be honest, I uh, I don't really understand. I'm not a particularly large or imposing guy. You can hear my voice. I mean, I've got three graduate degrees, one of them being a medical doctorate. Uh, and I think they're, you know, I think they might have a, a bachelor's and an MBA. But um, I certainly don't go around flaunting these things, nor do I speak in a way that, you know, a bunch of technical terms or anything. Just your average guy. Yeah, that's and that's what you think is that you're just this average guy, right? That's not what they think, that you're just this average guy. They think that you are a know-it-all. They think that you are trying to impose your will. They think that just because you have various graduate degrees, that you're the smartest guy in the room and therefore are not willing to accept input from other people. doesn't matter whether or not that is accurate. It matters that that's what they're probably thinking. So um, the fastest way to remove yourself as a threat is to identify yourself as a perceived threat to them. Accusations audits. At the beginning of the conversation, 
laying out what I just said. You probably think that I'm a know-it-all. You probably think that I have no, I assign no value to your input or your management of this project. And you probably think that I'm just here to impose my will so I can have the light shine on me and not you. You start to throw those things out there before you engage them in a difficult conversation. And you start to look like a mind reader. (laughs) Christian, you start to look like you are a, a soothsayer or a psychic. Because you're starting to you're starting to shine a light on sentiment that they have not expressed yet. And when you do that, there is no clearer way to demonstrate to another person that you're trying to see it from their perspective than when you start to identify negative emotions and dynamics that they haven't spoken into the air yet. So remove yourself as a threat, get out in front of it. If you think that they believe that you're a threat, identify that for them. Because as I mentioned earlier in the call, people want other people to understand what they're going through, what they think, how they feel, what their perspective is. When you start to do that before they actually say anything, you're starting to diminish yourself as a threat. And the other side starts to become more collaborative. They become less emotional. They become more logical. And what have you, what, what have you done? You're putting them in a, posit- in a positive frame of mind. You've heard the, the stats thrown around before. People's brains work up to 31% better when they're in a positive frame of mind. If I know that they view me as a threat, I don't want them thinking about me being a threat as we push through this conversation because then they're not listening to anything that I say. They're just focused on their own internal monologue surrounding you being a threat. So I want to take care of that as early in the conversation as possible. The best way to do it is, is with uh, the accusations audit. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to put somebody on the spot right now. I'm going to throw it to Chris. I think Chris is on <laughs> now. So I'm going to throw it to Chris and see what, what he has to say about that. I'd love to hear this. I have a follow-up, too, for that. Very curious about this. Yeah, sorry. I was delayed there for a second because uh, I was tweeting out your brilliance, Derek. I'm sitting here uh, taking notes, trying to keep up on the, the stream of consciousness. But, yeah, you know, there's, uh, as Derek said, this accusation's order. Do you, you start throwing this stuff out. Like, you know how they see you. You know, one of the things that we tell people to get out in front of this, what would you want to deny? Like, you, before you get started talking, uh, you would want to say, look, I don't want it to sound like I seem like I'm a know-it-all who's just waving my three degrees around because I'm insecure. You know, if you do it in a humorous fashion, make the two-millimeter shift from the denial of the negative because you know in your gut instinct how they're reacting, and you would want to deny that. Instead, say it out loud. You know, I probably think, think, seem like a guy with, you know, nine million degrees uh, <laughs> who just wants to show people. And, it, and if you do it on top of that in a humorous fashion, the self-effacing humor is uh, incredibly disarming. So you kind of get a double whammy going at the same time there. You're doing the accusations or that Derek is talking about. And then, you know, you're doing it with a little bit of a humorous approach and you really are going to save yourself a massive amount of time at getting them to listen to you it uh, it just it's the fastest mechanism to get them to listen clear their head out which is exactly what Derek was just talking about no the follow-up was what if that backfires and they turn around and say what kind of arrogant person are you that you think I'm afraid of you or is that just a question of my delivery being poor? Both Chris, go first. Chomping, chomping at the bit on this one. <laughs> well, here's... Yeah, so, here's go, go for it, man. <laughs> no, no, uh, go ahead. I, I All right, so here, here's the thing, Christian. That's, that's you in your brain. That's you inside your own brain negotiating with yourself prior to getting into the conversation. You've already compromised what you want to say because 
in your, as Chris calls it, in, in your holodeck, you've imagined an adverse response to the accusations audit. That is a hurdle that all of you are going to struggle with. All of you are going to struggle with pointing that negative light back at yourself because that's counterintuitive. And what if it drives an adverse response from the other side? And that's going to hold you back. The adverse response from the other side is replete with what? Christian, it's replete with more information. Mm. You're not saying this is the case. You're saying this is probably the case. This might be the case. This may be the case based on the totality of the circumstances. You're making a situationally intelligent and insightful guess based on all the data that's been produced for you. But you're not saying it's a fact. You're not passing judgment. You're saying this is this is tantamount. The accusations audit is tantamount to a preemptive label. And when you are labeling someone in the regular sense, you're saying it looks like it seems like it sounds like you're not saying it is a fact unless you know it to be a fact. You're not saying that it is a fact. You're saying this is the data you're giving me. And you're basically asking the other side, how is what I'm hearing wrong? So if you get that adverse effect from your counterpart, you should feel pretty good about that because they're telling you what's important to you. Or I'm sorry, what's important to them. They're telling you this is where you need to focus. How arrogant are you to think that we are that afraid of you? All right. It has nothing to do with you being a threat and has everything to do with their perception of you as being a know-it-all, being arrogant. And so that's what you need to go after. And when I say go after, you can go after it as simply as saying you follow with, with a mirror, arrogant, and then a calibrated question or I mean an asking label. An asking label. It sounds like you got a reason for saying that. Again, Christian, what we're trying to do, in essence, is get them to dump their bucket. Get it all out. It's not going to feel good. You're going to be offended by some of the stuff you say, but so what? You go back to what I said when we began this call. It's not about you. It's about them. And they've been telling you in no uncertain terms through their behavior over the time that you've known them that they view you as arrogant and you've done nothing to acknowledge it. That's where that's coming from. That's the moment that you have to have the courage to stay in. Because I'm telling you, even your most strident, your most ardent, for lack of a better term, opponents, you will see a softening of the outer shell once you acknowledge the fact that that's how they see you. And I, and I, I cut you off, Chris, so go ahead and add what you wanted to add. No, man, you just get your small stakes practice in. I mean, this the crazy thing about uh, the accusations order approach. Like, because you've got an amygdala, everybody goes through this. Like, oh, my God, I can see this going bad. And... The only way you're going to get yourself out of that is in your small stakes interactions to practice it. And you do it over and over again. And you're like, you know, this just doesn't let me down. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not that it might never backfire, but so far it never has. <laughs> we just, <laughs> this is just such a strong approach across the board. And one of the things that on our team, and as we continue to advance the Black Swan method, Derek coaches more than anybody else on our team. And he has even evolved uh, how we apply the accusations audit. Because pretty much if you're being coached by Derek, his answer is going to be, I need you to do more accusations audits. I mean, it's just, it, it is just almost a magic fairy dust. And he accelerates more outcomes by getting people to just really robustly and fearlessly go after the accusations order approach 
that it's it you know it's you know you're at Hogwarts and he's Gandalf he's teaching you so <laughs> um, you know try it out in the small stakes and uh, and you'll be really happy with that. Thank you both. That was very insightful. Yeah, man, for sure. Thank you, Christian. These are great questions. If you could just drop your any other questions in the chat, we'll try to get to you. Um, Henrik, would you like to try again? Hey, by the way, I get. I guess I just mixed up my movies there, didn't I? Get. I got. I got. Uh, Gandalf was never at Hogwarts with me. Yeah, I'm sure that that wound up in the comment section somewhere in the chat. Henrik, I think we're still having issues. Let me see. By the way, by the way, Derek, how, how big's your? Uh, I I've, I I wasn't blessed with the large uh, mango shaped amygdala like like you uh mine's only about the size of an almond <laughs> and there's it, no double entendre going on here you know, De derek is uh he's more accurate on details than, than i am and i think what would i say once the uh my amygdala was the size of a walnut and, and you were kind of to point out to me that uh, they're all the size of almonds right yeah, and and my attention to detail is is such that it, when he said that, and he said it in a public setting in front of many people, it was almost like uh, he had he had smacked me in the face with a brick. I, I it, it took me hours to recover from that. All right, we have another question from Steve. Steve, could you unmute your microphone? Am I live? You are live. All right. Thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is about negotiating with an assertive personality, and I'm an accommodator, and he uh, has anchored high in this business negotiation, and uh, fully so. He's he's got something I want. But, uh, just trying to figure out how we could best. Uh, work him down a little bit. All right. So there's a couple of things there. First of all, you you identify this person as an assertive. Of the three personality types, um, I, and I should say all three person of the personality types have something as important to them as making the deal. And what do you think that is for the assertive? Let me let me back up. Let me give it to you. Let me tell you what the accommodator likes more than the deal. Let me tell you what the analyst likes more than the deal, and then I'll throw it out to you, Steve, as a question. What you think the assertive for the accommodator? What is as important to them as making the deal is maintaining the relationship, particularly maintaining the relationship in the moment. That's most important to them. You can get into a room with an accommodator, and you guys can come up with absolutely no resolution to what you're talking about but the accommodator will feel good as long as the relationship is still there. The analyst, what's as important to an analyst than making the deal is data and information. As an analyst, if I go into a negotiation, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but if the, if the deal falls through, I'm okay with it as long as I've been made smarter in the process. Because I'm all about getting more data. I want to confirm the data that I went into the negotiation with. And I want to come out with a little bit more uh, than what I came in with. And if those two things are checked, yes, I'm in a good spot. So, Steve, what do you think is as important to the assertive as making the deal? I, I think in this situation, it's, it's his ego. And I think he wants to be perceived as he is making the best deal for him. You cut off a little bit there. I'm assuming that you said E as an ego. Ego, yes. All right. 
that's the bottom line. They want to be heard and they want to be respected. And that's fueled by their ego. The deal can go to hell in a handbasket as long as you know when you leave that room that they are the man or that they are the woman. And if that if that has been satisfied for them, they don't really get wound up around the axle as to whether or not the deal goes through. And so understanding what's important to them to be heard and respected. People often think of the assertive as being the most difficult of the three to deal with. The reality is they're not because all you got to do is shut your mouth. And let them drive the bus and they will tell you exactly what you need to know to move them in the direction that you need to move them in. Now, as, as for the high anchor, high anchors, that's a hack. That's a go-to move for everybody because they've read previous books prior to Never Split the Difference coming out. And many of those books espousing anchoring high when they know for a fact that everybody else on the other side, everybody else who's receiving that high anchor knows that nobody anchors where they intend on ending up. And so I'm coaching you, Steve. I'm telling you, I'm going to make him or her defend that high anchor. Something to the effect of, you know, it sounds like you took that number under a lot of deliberation before you landed on it. Would you be against walking me through how you came up with it? That's going to tell you right away. Are they posturing or is this, is this anchor more solid than, than what you thought it would be? Make them defend it. Let's, let's figure out where that's coming from. In this situation, he he has told me that he doesn't want to give away the goose that lays the golden egg. Why would I want to do that? Is what he's told me in our previous conversation. All right. And so that goes back to what we talked about earlier. Not, don't get caught up in what he said. What, where is that coming from? When somebody tells you, I don't want to give away the goose that lays the golden egg, what is he really telling you? That he's got a business that uh, has a lot of cash flow. And why would he want to give it away for a cheap price? It goes deeper than that, Steve. It goes deep. It's, it's more primal than that. It's more animal than that. Hmm. You're staying on the surface right now. He's telling you something else when he says, I don't want to give away the goose that lays the golden egg. Okay. Why would anybody say that to you? I don't know. I, I bet you do. And I'm going to help walk you through it a little bit. I don't want to give away the goose that lays the golden egg. Translation. I'm afraid that you're going to take advantage of me on price. I'm afraid that you are going to take advantage of the value that I believe um, this product or service holds. I'm afraid of what this is going to make me look like internally. If I am asking for 150 bucks and we settle on a hundred bucks, what yep. kind of reflection is that going to be of me with my peers internally with my boss internally? He's telling you, dude, I am under a lot of pressure to make sure that I don't get taken advantage of on this deal. That's what I don't want to lay. I don't want to give away the goose that lays the golden egg is screaming. So it's kind of going back to ego. again. Going back to ego. Sounds like you're under a lot of pressure on your side to come in at a specific margin. Sounds like, sounds like they're kicking you in the teeth on your side of the table to make sure that you're not taken advantage of. 
Yep. It sounds like you've been burned in the past. That's what it is. It's a fr- it's it's a fear of something that has to do with his ability to save face. He's either been burned in the past. They're clubbing him about the head and shoulders over this deal, telling him you better not give it away. And that's what he's afraid of. That is the area of the conversation where you need to focus in on. Stop worrying about the actual words that he's using and let's figure out what is that latent dynamic. Now I threw that out for you, Steve, I'll bet you that what I said to you made sense. And it only made sense to you because internally you knew that was going on. You knew that's what that statement meant. You just probably couldn't articulate it uh, because you're still, doing this at a, a at a surface level. Most of you are still doing this at a surface level. I want to get you off of the surface. Well, and part of that is because I'm a slow guy from South Dakota, so I'm really just slow. Yeah, well, you said that I didn't, but <laughs> what I will tell you, Steve, is that what you have going for you is you're a human being. And you have the same human nature responses as everybody else. Fear drives you to do certain things. Fear is driving your assertive counterpart into doing and saying certain things. And we collectively as people get so shook up by the fact that somebody says, you take this out of the contract or we're not going to sign. And then we start to freak out and we go back to our people and we say, we got to do something or they're going to walk. When the reality is, would the you need way to, to work around that coming. be rather than take away, or we're not going to sign if he added in more things and we'll sign. It's it's the same thing. It's the same thing. If they want something added, what are they telling you? You you you, Steve, are getting all freaked out that he wants to add certain things to it. What does that really say? That he's afraid he's not getting enough. That he's not seeing the value of what's already on the table and he wants you to sweeten the pot. So let's go after that fear of not being provided the value to find out where, what's generating that. What's, 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 what's causing that. Pushbacks, objections, changes to agreements are all cloaks. Cloaks for fear of something. And that's what we need to focus on, not what they're actually ask, asking, saying, or doing. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. I mean, it's, it's an ego thing. I think it's a safe face thing. And that does make sense to me, you know. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Steve. We have one last question from Dean. Dean, could you unmute your microphone? Hi, Derek. Thank you. Uh, Massively insightful as always. Um, Thank you. A quick question around authority. So the Milgram experiment from 1963, which has been replicated thousands of times over, continues to demonstrate our sort of evolutionary obedience to authority in the right conditions. I'm just wondering if you've got any advice for good people that might be being asked to do bad things by their leaders right now. Um, Good people who are being asked to do bad things. Um, Okay. So, Again, this goes back to not being victimized, not being manipulated. We talk about tactical empathy. We talked about seeing the world through the eyes of um, the other individual that we're dealing with. But that does not come at the expense of us being put into an ethically challenging position. And it does not outweigh our 
defenses when it comes to being manipulated. So if you've got a boss who's asking good people to do bad things, that to me is tantamount to manipulation. And I'm not going to stand for it. I don't expect any of you to stand for it. If they're asking you to do something that is against procedure, policy, practice, or the law, instead of being offended that they did that, let's find out where that is coming from. And it goes back to just simply using the quick two plus one in that regard to find out where is this coming from? It's, and, and I would hit them with it. it. It sounds like you want me to go outside of policy, procedure, practice, or the law. Because there are some people who will ask you to do something that's not necessarily within policy, practice, procedure, or the law and not have really thought about it. And so one of the first thing questions that I need to ask myself and then ultimately ask them, is this, is this deliberate or are they, are they ignorant of some fact along the way? Because some, some bosses will ask you to do bad things and not really realize that they've asked you uh, to do a bad thing. And so let's, let's figure out where it's coming from. If it's ignorance, then you're going to be provided an opportunity to um, lay out for them how they're off base. If it's deliberate, then you may want to go down the road of finding out why, without asking why, they think that that is a good idea. But even with the people, even with people in authority positions, and you're a subordinate, that does not absolve you of deferentially and in a subordinative way challenging what's being asked of you. And, and, and this is specifically for, you know, the, 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 the sergeant on the police department that tells me, pop the trunk. If we find anything in there, then we'll go get the search warrant. Wait a minute. We're not, we're not doing that. If we've got probable cause to believe that whatever we're looking for is in that trunk, then let's go get the paper now. We're not going to pop the trunk to see what's in there and then retroactively apply for a search warrant because you're not supposed to do that. And so in that instance, I, I, I would simply label it. It sounds like you want me to work outside what's prescribed in the statute when it comes to search warrants and this car. You labeling it and throwing it out there, putting it in the ether, when it lands in their ear, you may take them to a place of consideration that they hadn't been before. And so to your question, Dean, it just there's nothing that says, especially if it's illegal, that you have to, number one, follow that order, number two, not challenge the order or the, the efficacy of it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much.